Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Spurs Chat Podcast. I've got returning guest Ryan Taylor with me, of course, sports journalist with the Daily Mirror. Ryan, lovely to have you here. How are you? All good. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for inviting me back on. It's always uh, good to see that snazzy intro again. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to having a chat about Spurs. Well, Ryan, I'm smiling. I tell you, the last couple of times that we've spoken and uh, you've always been a fantastic guest on this channel. So thanks Thank so much for your time. I know I know how the January transfer window is so busy for all of you journalists and you know, lots yeah. going on. But we spoke off air there. Not a lot is going on during this January transfer window for a lot of Premier League clubs, but it is going on for Tottenham. Spurs have done transfer business early. What have you made of the, uh, the signing so far? Timo Werner, of course, on loan. Um, you know, with an option to buy in the summer. Of course, Radu Dragusin is over the line. Spurs may want to get one or two more in in this window, may want to get one or two more out of the window. What have you made of Tottenham's business so far? I think, Chris, I think the key really is that the business has been done fast and, you know, there's, there's been a clear idea and understanding of what they actually want to bring in for uh, Ange Postacoglu. I think it's a notoriously difficult market January to get players because, you know, selling clubs don't want to lose players halfway through a season. Um, and, you know, we don't tend to see historically many big deals happen in January. So I think the, the fact Spurs have moved quickly is particularly pleasing for supporters and, you know, Ange as well. Um, I think the Werner signing is a, a smart bit of business. I think, you know, on the basis of what we saw yesterday, he's not really changed as a player. He's, you know, chaotic. He'll get chances. He might not take them all, but he's a dangerous player. He's got good attributes. Um, and as for Dragosin, I mean, I can't pretend to have seen much of him. However, I know he's very highly rated within the game. Um, he actually came close to joining Chelsea several years ago when he went to Juventus. Um, and he was also looked at by Crystal Palace a couple of years ago. But his stock seems to have risen drastically since then. Um, and as I just said, you know, I think the, the speed of the deals is something that will really please, you know, Spurs as a club. Um, because it does give them sort of... Um, you know, a couple more weeks now to look at potential further recruits, including a central midfielder. Right, that's exactly where I wanted to go, because, of course, we're all very, very pleased with the business we've done so far. And when you look in the summer as well, you know, Ange Postacoglu, of course, come in. We got deals over the line very quickly. Then the likes of James Madison, uh, Mickey van der Ven, of course, come in. Vicario came in. Um, you know, some people even criticise the, the signing of, of players like Vicario. Uh, because a lot of uh, fans wanted David Raya instead, who, of course, ended up going to Arsenal. But what have you made of um, the speed of the of the, of the the way that Spurs are getting these deals done and, and how they're getting these deals done now? Because it just seems to be a very, very different Tottenham operating to what we're, we're used to seeing. Um, you know, Spurs fans, we're, we're so used to waiting late on in the window uh, for transfers then to happen. You know, Pochettino went 518 days you know, multiple transfer windows without a signing. What do you think has changed at the football club? It's hard to, obviously, when you're on the outside, it is very hard to sort of, I'm not someone that covers Spurs on a weekly basis. So it is hard to kind of gauge, you know, who's having the, the biggest influence. But obviously, you know, it's well documented that Fabio Paratici is still working for the club on a consultancy basis. Um, I think he's had a big influence on a lot of these signings, Vicario being one. Um, James Madison's obviously a household name in the Premier League, but internally, he was a player that Spurs um, were totally in agreement with across the hierarchy that he was a player they wanted to bring to the club. And um, obviously, Johan Lange has come in now. He's uh, he's big on data, as we've seen in his previous roles with Aston Villa. Um, so I think there's a I think there's a structure in place and there's a um, sort of a process in, in terms of how Spurs are recruiting players now. And if you know you think about some of the signings they've made. You know, not necessarily in this window or the last summer, but one that sticks out for me is uh, Pat Matasar. I think, you know, yeah. looks an absolute steal at this moment in time. He seems to be getting better with every performance that goes by. And, um, you know, that was another sign in Paratici was involved in. I think he's got a web of, of contacts and a network across, you know, European football. And he knows Italian football at the back of his hand, which is why I wasn't too surprised to see Spurs move for, for Dragosin, who I must say, you know, when I was sort of collecting information ahead of the transfer window, I wasn't fully aware that Dragosin was a player that Spurs were looking at. So the club have done well to kind of keep that under wraps. I know Bayern Munich came in at the end and tried to get a deal done, but but some of the other names were kind of um, 
you know, ones that have been floated about for, for several months, the likes of Mark Gahey, um, obviously Tosin Adarabaya, there's been a lot of um, interest in him. Um, he's a homegrown player, which is of, you know, particular interest to clubs nowadays. So um, I think Spurs done well to kind of keep that under wraps. And the Werner deal as well, it sort of came out of nowhere. Mm. Sky Germany reported that, you know, a deal was close, I think, last week at some point. And, you know, within a couple of days, Werner was flying in for his medical. So I think that's shrewd business. And, you know, certainly in the past sort of um, year or so, I've really noticed, you know, working as a journalist, when, you, when you're trying to build contacts and sources at clubs and you try and get stuff out of clubs to, you know, see what's kind of going on. But, you know, nowadays there seems to be a bigger demand than ever to keep information under wraps. And uh, obviously you do have to try and build a relationship with these clubs. But I really believe from the top hierarchies, um, you know, board members and technical directors, sporting directors, there's a kind of um, determination to try and sort of uh, keep keep key targets under wraps because these drawn out sagas where we see stuff sort of um, peddled in the media all the time. It really doesn't help situations. It leads to inflated price tags you know, fan frustration. I think, you know, that's something you have to take into account with Tottenham. They've, they've been really sort of discreet about how they've gone about their business. And I think, you know, ultimately, um, the proof's been in the pudding really about how quick they've got them over the line. And fans seem to be generally very satisfied. We're certainly satisfied right now, Ryan, I tell you that. And uh, we're all very pleased by the appointment of Ange Postacoglu and, and where Tottenham are at and where we're going. Uh, with the amount of injury problems, suspensions, and now players off on international duty, um, of course, Spurs drew 2-2 at Manchester United yesterday, which, to be fair, I, I see as a good point um, with the amount of uh, players that we had missing. Um, I know Van der Ven and um, Romero both come back yesterday, but we have had struggles on and off the pitch all season. Are you surprised, um, on a professional basis, working with the Daily Mirror, how well Ange Postacoglu has done, where Spurs are at right now. And another question for you, are you surprised that Ange Postacoglu said, you know, we're in the mix, we're in the title race? I mean, to go back to the start of your question, I think I am still a little bit surprised, but I was always in the camp that I thought Postacoglu was a good appointment. I think I've said it on the channel and I said it at the time. I think... I don't know why, but I really sort of warmed to, the more I sort of read and, and listened to him talking ahead of his Spurs appointment, I really warmed to him. I think he's got a clear idea of how he wants his teams to play football. I think he's a, he's got authority. I think you don't want to mess with someone like that. Um, you know, when I sort of compare him to, um, you know, Eric Ten Hag, and this is not a personal attack on, on Manchester United, but I really think some of the situations he's handle, handled internally could have been done yeah. incredibly differently. And Postacoglu strikes me as someone that keeps his house in order. Um, you know, some of his press conferences, particularly at the start, were, you know, brilliant to, to listen to him pl talking about players and, and mental health struggles, things like that, stuff you can relate to in, you know, society. I think he's got a great understanding of, um, you know, just the culture of football and, and things like that. I'm just going to have to let my dog out. I'm really sorry. He's right next to me. <laughs> Apologies, Chris. Um, he's scratching no on the door. Um, but yeah, he, he had a, a clear understanding and vision of, of how he wanted his, his team to look. And I think Spurs can get on board with that. They, Spurs fans, to me, my understanding is that they want a team they can relate to. And obviously last season, that was not the case. You know, going to matches become a chore. Um, there was no atmosphere inside the, the ground. And, it, you know, Spurs were ultimately playing for nothing. Um, and I think, you know, Postacoglu has done an incredible job in, in bringing that kind of uh, spirit. and. Um, as I said, it's a team that fans can relate to and be excited about. And he mentioned earlier in the season, you know, let fans dream when they're getting carried away when, you know, you were sat top of the league after seven or eight games. And, uh, you know, Postacoglu said it, it's not for me to say fans can't dream. So I like that. Um, and in terms of the last part of your question, um, I think... I'm surprised the level Spurs are at, to be honest. I think there's obviously been bumps in the road and we expected that when there was a few injuries because it was too good to be true at the start, really. You know, everyone was fit. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, when Spurs have their best 11 to hand, I think, you know, they're a serious force to be reckoned with. But the depth just isn't quite there at the moment. That's not to say it won't be there um, in a few transfer windows time. I mean, two players have already come in. I know you've got players on international duty in 
you know, still a handful of injuries. So um, it's always going to be a case of you're not at full strength. But I think, you know, the depth is slowly but surely going to improve Spurs. And, uh, you know, I think they're ahead of where people expected them to be at this moment in time. And, you know, that's all you want at the end of the day. You want to be competing. I think at the start of the season, top four would have been a great season for Spurs. And, you know, I, I don't see any reason at this moment in time why that's out of reach. Certainly not. I think Villa are still going to drop off a bit. Um, and if you look at the table, you know, Spurs aren't particularly far behind Arsenal, who, you know, up until a few weeks ago, everyone was saying, you know, what an incredible campaign they've had. Right. You spoke about the uh, the depth there. When Spurs do have every single player back, fit and available, and Foster Coglu's disposal and, and to use, um, how good is this squad? What more do Tottenham need to be title contenders and really push the likes of Manchester City and perhaps Liverpool this season? I don't really know, to be honest. I think it's more a case of consistency and you know building that mentality. If you look at Liverpool, for example, slowly but surely over the years under Klopp, they gained that experience of how to handle these, um, you know, these run-ins, certain fixtures. Um, and I still see Spurs as quite a youthful side, although there is quite a few ex- experienced players in there. Um, I still think they're a side that have got a little bit more of um, maturing to do. And um, But they're only going to get better. And if you look across the park, there's so many players that, you know, for the level they're performing at already, they're, they're mature beyond their years in that sense. But I think once they gain that experience and gel to, together as a unit, I think Spurs are really going to be a side that probably... Um, raise a few eyebrows and, and as in um, not raise a few eyebrows sorry but upset the apple cart because I think obviously everyone looks at Liverpool Manchester City but I think Postacoglu is um, I think his team's only going to get better I mean that probably seems a bit cliche to, see, to say at the moment but I really see what he's trying to build and um, you know there's that excitement you've got a lot of players that have just come in that are making a difference like Van der Ven Udogi um, Brennan Johnson I know he's not quite had the numbers but Every time I watch him play, I think he's a really good player and I see huge room for improvement. Um, I think midfield, though, is still an area where, you know, maybe Spurs lack something. Um, I think, you know, defensively, maybe they could shore things up a little bit. But I think, you know, when Basuma, Sarr and Madison are fit, there's no question that that's a, a top midfield. But I think you still need a couple of players in reserve to, you know, build the squad and cope with the amount of fixtures, I think. You know, Ben Tankor's had a, a, a rotten time with injuries, really. But, you know, he's a very good midfielder. But, you know, you sort of need sort of five or six top midfielders now to, to go the distance. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in attack, obviously, you know, it's been a strange season, really, for Spurs. Because Son, at the start of the season, looked like, you know, he was absolutely on fire. He's dropped off a little bit now. Richarlison's come back in. He's starting to hit form. So, I think it's a case of finding an established front three that you can continue building with. And I I wouldn't be surprised if another forward does come in in the summer. So I think it's exciting times, ultimately. Ryan, what what do you expect to happen from now until the 1st of Feb, 11pm, for for Spurs, either ins and outs? Do you expect anyone to go out the door? I'm going to give you some names shortly anyway, but do you expect anyone to go out the door? And, And how many other players do you expect to come through the door for Postacoglu? I still believe there's going to be another signing. I think, you know, the fact they've got their business done so early, um, to me, that tells me, I I know Postacoglu wanted the bodies through the door, but to me, it it gives them a little bit more time now to have a think about, you know, what could be next. Maybe that midfield player. It's it's widely reported that they they really like Conor Gallagher Spurs. Um, And, you know, from my understanding, that is very much true. It's just an awkward situation to navigate because, you know, although Chelsea uh, are yet to offer him a new contract, um, you know, selling to a direct rival mid-season would be a, a PR disaster. And Gallagher has been a mainstay in, in Pochettino's side. He wants to stay at the club. He, from my understanding, he, he's not actively looking for a transfer. I think that would only become a, a situation that materialises if he's literally told that, you know, you, you may be better off considering offers elsewhere. Um, but there is a little bit of frustration because, you know, Chelsea considering he's a key player, they haven't moved to tie him down to a new deal. And I think that's only going to stretch so far. He'll be into the final 12 months of his contract at the end of the season. And obviously, that's when the power shifts from the club to the player. So if the player wants to run down his contract, he holds all the cards, he can earn a bigger salary elsewhere. 
Um, obviously, his value decreases as well. So I, I'm sort of tentative to to forecast whether there's going to be a, a formalisation of Spurs' interest for the end of the window. However, we've seen with Werner and Dragutin that it appears Spurs do have, you know, maybe some surprise targets up their sleeve. Um, you know, we saw that with Vicario as well. It was a bit of a rabbit out of the hat. Everyone saying, you know, who's this guy? But, you know, he's been a, a very good goalkeeper so far. Um, so I think there'll be a plan in place. In terms of outgoings, I think it's the usual kind of tidying up of the squad. I think, you know, there's one that I could potentially see movement on, and that's Brian Hill. But at the same time, um, nothing at the moment concrete to say that that's one that would definitely happen. I think Hill is a valued member of the squad. I think he'll probably be a bit frustrated that Werner came straight in instead of him um, in the starting lineup. Um, but there's there has been interest from Fiorentina and Feyenoord. Um, no Spurs, from my understanding, have not been contacted by anyone about a deal. So, um, sorry, Spurs have been contacted, but uh, his representatives haven't been contacted. So, very... Um, very early interest at this stage, nothing kind of big. The other one that I, I assumed, you know, there, there could potentially be movement because there always is talk about his future, and that's um, Gio Celso. Um, but mm-hmm. Costa Cogley wants to keep him at the club. Obviously, he's got a bit of a hamstring injury at the moment, I believe. Um, don't expect him to leave at this moment in time, but you know, there's been a lot of interest in him in, in, in recent times from uh, you know, even Barcelona, Villarreal were looking at, at bringing him to the club on a permanent basis, didn't quite happen. Um, but Ange likes Lo Celso and he, he wants to keep him at the club. But it's, uh, you know, it's difficult when he's not playing regularly. And, you know, you think when Madison comes back in, is he really going to play? Um, so, yeah, it's just a tidying up of the squad, really. Um, generic stuff that happens every January, you know, the same sort of players like Spence. I know he's gone to Genoa now, but these kind of players, you know, loans and things like that. So there's not anything concrete at this moment in time. But, um, you know, I believe there will still be movements. It's two weeks to go. and. Um, you know, it's been quiet so far and the end of the window is always um, frantic. Ryan, is the, uh, we spoke earlier about um, the lack of transfers in the Premier League so far. Is this, yeah. is, is the main reason for that about financial fair play now because clubs are scared to spend money because they perhaps want to invest in the summer instead of the January transfer window because they know that signings are very, very different in this window? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, obviously, the, the 10-point deduction Everton have um, you know, been sanctioned with has actually been a little bit of a wake-up call for a lot of these clubs that have um, you know, sailed close to the wind in terms of their financial records, the sustainability rules. Um, I think it's um, there's going to be... I think that, to me, I know there's a lot of stuff that's been going on with Manchester City and everyone says, you know, how come Everton have been stung and made an example of? But I think there is going to be a tightening up of these you know, rules and that clubs are, are just not prepared to take risks at this moment in time. I look at Wolves, for example, mm. you know, in the summer, they, uh, and in previous transfer windows, they've had a really tough time trying to make room within a budget to sign players. And it's actually resulted in them, you know, selling players like Ruben Neves. Um, so sales are key nowadays. Um, but the problem a lot of these clubs have is they don't actually have many sellable assets. Now, Tottenham aren't one of those because they've got a lot of players um, with good value, players like Spence, Joe Roden. Um, I know they've sold, you know, a fair few players, that, including Harry Kane. Um, but you know, there's a lot of players on the fringes of their squad. And I look at teams like Liverpool now. Um, there's not really too many players in their squad they can sell. You look at Arsenal. Not only Fowler and Balogun went in the summer. Really, that was a notable sale. And and when you're spending 208 million on signings, um, it's hard to kind of record on that balance sheet. Um, you know, a um, a balancing of the books. Um, but Spurs have done well, to be honest. I think the Kane sale was good because um, although it was, um, you know, a tragedy in, in some respects that Kane left the club, um, obviously Spurs have done so well without him. But, um, you know, from a, a personal perspective, losing Kane was, you know, not ideal for Spurs. But the fact it happened so late in the window has actually given Tottenham a little bit of... Um, of wiggle room in January um, because where it was so late, you know, I know Brennan Johnson came in, but the entirety of the money wasn't spent. And I know um, Postacoglu said a lot of their business was done in anticipation that Kane might depart. But, you know, when you get a big fee like that land on, um, mm. you know, on the table of your, the club accountants, it, it really does help things in terms of um, the financial fair play. So 
Um, I still believe Spurs have got room to, to do some more business if they want to do so. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of other clubs, it, it's certainly why one of the main reasons why it's been such a quiet window. And um, obviously, as I said earlier in the, in the video, um, you know, January is always notoriously difficult. You know, you see a lot of loans and creative deals. Um, yeah. Just because, you know, players nowadays are, are worth so much money that it, it's really hard to sort of get a quality player at a, you know, a realistic and um, efficient price. So um, it's a, it's very difficult. And, you know, certainly in the last five years, it's really changing the uh, the way the transfer market sort of um, operates because there's a lot more emphasis now on um, on getting deals done at good prices. Well, I'm going to go back to talk about Conor Gallagher because this story, yeah. um, you know, just keeps being uh, published again and again and again. Fabrizio Romano has stated that a deal was nearly done in the summer for Gallagher coming to Tottenham. Um, you don't think there's an issue with Chelsea and Spurs doing business with each other because under Abramovich, Chelsea never, ever wanted to do business with Tottenham, either players going there or, or players coming to Spurs. Do you think yeah. that's different now under Todd Bowley? I don't think it's so much under Todd Bowley. I mean, again, I, I mentioned just now like the, the transfer market's changing. If you look at Chelsea's front three in the Champions League final in 2021, Timo Werner, now at Spurs, Mason Mount now at Chelsea, um, Manchester United, Kai Havertz is at Arsenal. I think money talks at the end of the day, and I ultimately, um, you know, rivalries aren't quite what they were. You know, I don't think you see Liverpool, and Manchester City doing business, but at this moment in time, you know, if Chelsea decide they need to get rid of Conor Gallagher because of his contract situation, and you know, for whatever reason they're hesitant about agreeing a new deal when his value is decreasing. I think, you know, they're willing to sell to whoever that may be. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, it's not ideal to do business with your ideal right, with your arch rivals. Um, but at the same time, you know, Chelsea have done a lot of business with Arsenal in, in the past 10 years, five years. So I think cash is king, ultimately. Um, you know, a lot of these clubs just need to, to find the right pi price for a player. Um, and... I, I do see Spurs as genuine suitors for Gallagher. I've had a lot of conversations about this because there's been a lot sort of reported. I think it's about two weeks ago now, there was talk um, from Sky Italy that, you know, the formal talks have been open between the clubs. Now, from, from what I understand, there's been no formal talks this transfer window between Chelsea and Spurs for Gallagher. Mm -hmm. However, Spurs are looking at Gallagher's situation and if they sense an opening and they sense that Chelsea would be prepared to sell, um, I believe that they'll they'll submit an offer. Um, now the issue in the summer was Pierre Emil Hoiberg um, obviously had a bit of um, a strange end to the transfer window. Atletico Madrid came in for him. Um, Manchester United made an inquiry in Fulham, looked at getting him in as well because of the Jao Pellini deal to Bayern Munich. Um, but Spurs weren't ready to to let um, Hoiberg leave the club without a replacement, and it was just too late in the. Uh, the transfer window for um, the dominoes and stars to align. So, um, again, I personally, from from the conversations I have, Gallagher is, he wants to stay at Chelsea. He believes it's his home. He doesn't want to leave the club. So, I think it's a really big decision that would need to be weighed up because, you know, if you leave Chelsea for Tottenham, you know, you're, you're tarnishing your reputation, really. But I know a lot of supporters, um, Chelsea supporters, will be understanding that, you know, it's not necessarily his decision because, you know, in my book, if you have a top player and he's picked every week by the manager and he's English and he's an academy product, you'd want to tie him down at the first given opportunity. So I don't really understand what the delay here is. Right, we keep being linked with uh, Lloyd Kelly of Bournemouth. Um, he's going into the last year of his contract. Um, yeah. Although Spurs now signed um, Dragusin, do you, do you think that Spurs could pursue this signing of Lloyd Kelly? Hard to say at this moment in time because, you know, plans change. You know, Van der Ven's come in. Um, Kelly, obviously, there was a bid for him at the end of the transfer window, but Van der Ven's come in and, you know, it's pretty clear he's going to be the, the first choice left-sided centre-back um, for for a long time. So, um, obviously, Kelly can play at left-back as well, which is handy. I think Costa Coglu needs these kind of versatile operators that can play in multiple positions. Obviously, he's been Bournemouth captain as well, so there's leadership qualities there, he's English. Um, but I wouldn't say 
that's you know one that is very very likely to happen. I think it's you know probably one Spurs will assess in the summer. That said, I know there's a lot of clubs already in talks with his representatives over a deal: Stuttgart, AC Milan, Juventus. The player that's rated not only in England but in Europe as well. So I mm. think there will be fierce competition for him. Um, Bournemouth are still trying to tie him down to a new deal as well. I believe they've offered him a contract that would see him become one of the highest paid players at the club, but it looks as if he's ready to sort of move on to a new chapter. So we'll have to see. Um, but again, I, I do think the Van der Ven uh, situation has, has changed Tottenham's scope on that deal. Right, and lots of reports out in the in the last couple of days about um, Joe Gomez of Wolves, of course, Brazil midfielder. Is that yeah. a deal that you can see Spurs getting done or not? I have no information on that, to be honest, Chris. But I think Jao Gomez, from what I've seen, um, is a very tidy player that's going to go from strength to strength. I think I watched his um, his Premier League debut at Southampton last season with Wolves. And they had 10 men, but they beat Southampton 2-1. And he was brilliant. And I thought, you know, Wolves have got a real gem here. And we've really seen in the last sort of 18 months, clubs because of the Brexit rules and the complications surrounding um, transfers in a, a um, what's the word the legislation behind transfers a lot of clubs are now turning to South America to get these deals done um, mm-hmm. and they're signing a lot of gems you look at Murillo from Nottingham Forest I think he's been absolutely exceptional uh, they've got Danilo as well that came in from um, Palmeiras um, there's a lot of these um, sort of signings that have come from from South America and and Jao Gomez is one of the best and I think you know the fact he's looked so good really under uh, Gary O'Neill is uh, a sign that he's he's probably going to attract a lot of interest now I do see him as a, a sort of box to box player but a defensive midfielder so you know do Spurs necessarily need that I think they do need that number eight and Gomez can play that role and you know looks very energetic and affect the game at both ends of the fit at both ends of the field sorry so I think stylistically that would you know be a sensible sort of target, but again, Wolves are a team that you know would probably demand a, a big fee, maybe up to fifty million. Not quite aware of Spurs' finances, and you know if they were prepared to put that kind of money on the table, I think you're probably better off using that towards Gallagher. So um, it's hard to say at this moment in time. I don't have any information on the deal, but I've seen the reports from South America, and you know generally speaking, if there's reports in Brazil about you know interest it, it tends to be fairly um concrete but uh i think we'll have to wait and see on that one and i think again january walls i can't really see him selling so probably want to watch for the summer maybe it's fair to say though ryan isn't it that clubs look an awful lot of players so the amount of names that get linked to football clubs is just unreal um i wanted to ask you about Rashalison because you mentioned him earlier He's in fine form. Of course, he got another goal at Manchester United on Sunday. Um, That's now six in his last six Premier League games. He's had a hard time at Spurs, but he's finding goal scoring form now. We're being linked at the moment to Dominic Solanke and uh, also I've seen various reports stating that Spurs have sent scouts on a number of occasions to Norwich City to watch Jonathan Rowe. Any interest or any... um, any truth in, in both of those links and can you see that happening? And also to add another question, can you see Richarlison staying on as a Spurs player beyond the summer? Will Postacoglu want to stick with him or do you think we may cash in with the Saudi interest? I think on, on Richarlison, I think the, the dynamic sort of shifted, you know, in the, in the past couple of weeks and months. I think uh, when we spoke in August, um, I mentioned the Saudi interest and, you know, I did sort of say I would be surprised if Richarlison stayed put at the club, but I think slowly but surely he's starting to win over some of the supporters with his, you know, his goal scoring seems to have improved a lot in the last, you know, two months. I think, mm. you know, great goal yesterday. On, on his day, Richarlison is a, a strong player um, with great qualities, brings a lot to the table. I mean, he started up front for Brazil at the World Cup and, you know, that's no mean feat. So I think yeah. he's a player with potential, it's just consistency. That's the... You know, that's what separates a a top player and a world-class player. So I think we'll need to see how that sort of fares between now and the end of the season. Um, You know, would I be confident sticking with Richarlison as my number nine um, when I have aspirations of winning trophies? I would say probably not. Um, However, he has shown that he can step up to the market on occasions. Um, As I said, great goal yesterday. I really enjoyed that goal. I think that Richarlison is very good in the air. He's strong, 
finishing needs work. He missed a lot of chances. It was at the Brighton game in December. Um, great movement, but you know Kane probably would have had a hat trick from from some of the chances he had. Um, on Solanke, wouldn't believe everything you read. Um, there's been a lot about Arsenal and Solanke. Um, no interest from Arsenal at this moment in time. Um, obviously, when any player scores goals, there's going to be links in the media. Um, a lot of these don't have substance, unfortunately, and they're rumours that people like my dad see on his phone and uh, start telling me about. And I'm like, Dad, it's not true. Um, so I do fear for um, for some of the older football fans that see some of this nonsense on social media, because obviously, you know, you believe it straight away, and that's how the the rumours kind of uh, snowball. Um, and Jonathan Rowe is a player that is attracting a lot of Premier League interest. I know West Ham have been watching him closely. Um, and, you know, some of his goals for Norwich have been outstanding. So um, he does kind of fit that Spurs model. Historically, they've always sort of had an eye for young talents in the championship. I remember, you know, Gareth Bale when he was smashing it for, for Southampton. Obviously, Brennan Johnson's played in the championship with uh, Nottingham Forest. And, you know, now he's a, an established Premier League player. And, I actually think the championships a hotbed for for players. Um, mm. If you look at Victor Gokarez now, you know there's talk of Chelsea looking at him. He's got an 85 million pound release clause. I, I've almost been pulling my hair out how no Premier League club signed him from Coventry in the summer. I think you know someone like a Crystal Palace or you know even an Everton, West Ham. You know, you'd probably get 15 goals in the Premier League, maybe more. He's got great assets and attributes. Um, so I think any any club that goes in for Jonathan Rowe, um, there'll be a great reward for them. You look at Ivan Tony as well, another player that's you know made it look easy in the Premier League since coming up from the Championship. So I think it's a good market to to shop, and obviously you can get deals at, at reasonable prices as well. I mean, is he going to come in and be the main man at Spurs? Obviously not. Um, but is he a player that has got a big ceiling and has got huge potential? Yes. And, you know, that's probably worth taking a chance on, in my opinion. Ryan, what you said there about Richarlison, would you expect then that Spurs go out in the transfer market in the summer to try and sign a new number nine? What, if Richarlison was to go or in general? In general, if uh, if you're saying that you think that Postacoglu won't stick with him if, if, we've, you know, if we want to go and win the title, um, do you think yeah. that Spurs will assess that situation and, and, and perhaps go and, uh, go and buy a new number nine in the summer? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, all top clubs always have to be open for opportunities. I, I keep referencing Liverpool in these videos, but, um, you know, I think they're a great example in, in a time where, you know, you look at how far Chelsea and Manchester United have fallen about the sustainability mm -hmm. of Liverpool and, you know, how well Klopp has rebuilt this side sort of seamlessly, um, losing key players in the summer and, you know, being stronger for it. So, um, I look at Liverpool and how they kept adding forwards to that that incredible roster of, of attackers. And, you know, it's really sort of paid dividends. Um, I think Spurs almost have to mirror that in a sense. You know, they've got some great forward players, so much different options. You know, you've got dribblers, you've got quick players, you've got finishers. Um, but I still see Spurs as someone that are probably lacking that sort of Harry Kane presence. I mean, that sounds like stating the obvious, but, you know, someone who's got a guaranteed goal output um, you know, Richarlison, unfortunately, isn't that. Um, one player I will mention that I know Spurs have looked at is uh, Santiago Jimenez at, at Feyenoord. Um, he's very highly rated around Europe. There's been a lot of Premier League clubs going over, flying scouts over to um, Rotterdam to look at him in person in the Champions League and Eredivisie, um, Spanish clubs as well, Italian clubs. Um, and he's not going to be um, valued at a price tag that's going to be completely unreasonable. Um, something like 40 million would probably get final talking. So I think that's one to watch. Um, definitely expect him to, to move on in the summer, probably not this month. Um, but there is also players like Ivan Tony, who is, of course, you know, expected to leave Brentford at the end of the season. My understanding is that he will stay at Brentford this January. Um, obviously, there's been interest from Arsenal, but um, my latest information from Arsenal is there's just not enough money and finances in terms of their financial fair play records to, you know, pull off a deal like this. Now, Spurs, I have always um, understood Spurs are a team that are looking at Tony. I don't know if they've got the financial muscle to compete with Chelsea and Arsenal at the end of the season. Um, but a lot of people shot down Spurs' interest in Tony, whereas um, 
the information I've had is Spurs have always, been, I've always been told not to rule out Spurs, although Tony wants to join Arsenal um, and he would favour that move over going anywhere else at this moment in time. So I think there's a lot of um, interesting sagas that are going to sort of um, Tottenham will find themselves um, in the midst of in the summer at the end of the window, um, at the end of the season, sorry. Um, so yeah, I, I do ultimately expect Spurs to look at bringing in a striker um, because ultimately Richarlison isn't Harry Kane um, and I know it's unlikely that you'll get another player like Harry Kane um, but if Richarlison finishes the, the season with um, you know only 10 goals or something like that I think that's one that will need to be assessed because you know you look at all the top top sides you don't really win a championship unless you've got one standout goal scorer so I think Spurs are still lacking that I tell you what, Ryan, the Spurs fans don't speak about Harry Kane too much since he's left. And uh, Yeah, it, I've noticed it, that to be fair. Yeah. Um what did you make of no, the I'll, uh what did you make of the sorry, departure sorry. of Eric Dyer to Bayern Munich? I think just, just on, on Kane, Chris, quickly, I think, you know, that is incredible really, you know, what you said, and it is true. Um, you know, when Kane left Spurs, every single person thought, you know, Spurs are on you know, going but they're going to go backwards now. They're going to suffer. Um, yeah. You know, I rate Harry Kane so, so highly. I think he's absolutely elite. Um, but it's the fact Spurs have gone in a different avenue without him um, because there's a lot of, you know, it's a different style of play. They're not, not everything goes through Kane. They're more unpredictable. You've got Son, um, you know, sort of been free from the shackle. So I don't want to talk about it too much, but I think, you know, it is incredible really that, you know, we sit here sort of six months on or whatever it is from when he left. And, you know, he's, he's he's not forgotten because he's a legend, but he's forgotten in the sense he's not he's not necessarily missed. Um, and going to Eric Dyer, I think it's a great move for him. You know, I've always liked Eric Dyer. I think he's a top professional. He's always been good with the media. Um, I think he's, he's underrated in a sense because he can play in a, a lot of different positions in different systems. Um, and he was a vintage Spurs player during that Pochettino era when you know they had such a great side and it was the uh, you know the last few years at White Hart Lane and you know their memories I'm not a Spurs fan but their memories that will stay with me for a long time of that um, Spurs team and dies at the heart of it obviously he scored for England at the uh, the World Cup the, the penalty against Colombia but you know even that free kick against Russia at the European Championships in 2016 I think you know he had such a bright future but you know, just hasn't. I think he probably should have moved on a couple of years ago, but he loved Spurs and he didn't want to. Um, but great move for him. I think it will do brilliantly under Tuchel, who um, has spoken very highly of him. And, you know, he's got a lot more to give. He's only 29, I believe. And, you know, he's not played an awful lot of football in the past two years. So I think he can. A change is always good for someone that's, um, you know, experiencing a little bit of a, you know, a rut in a sense. Right, I've got a couple more names for you. Nottingham Forest star yeah. Morgan Gibbs White. Any any truth in that one? Blackburn midfielder Adam Morton and Middlesbrough midfielder Hayden Hackney. Can you see any of them happening? I don't know about January, Chris, but uh, Morton and Hackney are players that Spurs have looked at. But again, it's it sounds you know generic, but a lot of other Premier League sides are looking at them also. Um, yeah. And the first player you mentioned was Gibbs White. Um, sorry, I just rejogged my memory there. But he's not, um, to my understanding, he's not a player that Spurs are actively targeting. Obviously, you know, they probably will admire him because it, it's fair to say, you know, most people look at Morgan Gibbs White now and think he's a very um, talented footballer that seems to be um, getting better. Um, and Paratici obviously made a few trips to Nottingham Forest, not last season, but the season before, to look at Brennan Johnson and Jed Spence. Yeah. Um, and, you know, although it wasn't um, at the time, I think Forrest is seen as a club that, you know, really sort of um, develop youngsters and these young players. I know they're not going for a particularly great time now, but I mentioned Murillo earlier. I think it's a good club for, um, you know, regular playing time. And that change Gibbs White made was um, a tough one to leave Wolves, but it's paid dividends because he's a, a key player now. Um, and I'm sure Spurs will have been watching his performances with. Um, you know, admiration. But again, you know, I look at Spurs' squad, do they really need a Morgan Gibbs White at this moment in time? I'm not sure. Mm. Ryan, two last questions for you. Um, 
who entertains you the most in the Premier League? And if I was to ask you to predict the top four, including the Premier League champions at the end of the year, who are you going to go with? Um, in terms of entertainment, it depends because I know it's a, a long-winded way of answering the question, but to me, I like attacking football. I don't like um, you know, the possession-based stuff too much. Um, I think Manchester City are obviously an incredible, you know, the, probably the best team in the world without doubt. But to me, you know, if I watch them playing at home against a Sheffield United, I, I wouldn't be too um, too enthralled. Um, I like watching Liverpool's counter-pressing. Um, I've really enjoyed watching Aston Villa this season, particularly sort of um, about October, November time when they were playing at home and sort of blitzing teams. I think, you know, fearless yeah. football. Um, but at the start of the season, I loved watching Spurs as well. So um, I like contrasting styles. I've always liked attacking football. Um, and in terms of, of answering your question on the top four, I think Manchester City will be champions. Um, I think Liverpool have done so well to be where they are at this moment in time. But I just see City is getting stronger and stronger. Obviously, Haaland's been out. Seems yeah. like they had a little bit of a wobble. But, you know, you've got players like De Bruyne coming back, like Oscar Bob chipping in. And you know, he looks like he's going to be another top player. Um, I just think City have got that. Um, that they get into that groove in the second half of the season. They've gone out ten wins in a row, and you know I don't think it'd be too long before the the pendulum swings and Liverpool maybe four or five points off. Um, but I think Liverpool have done brilliantly. I think they'll finish second. I think Arsenal will finish third, and I think it'll be a shootout between Villa and Spurs. But I'll go with Spurs to uh, to um, to save the abuse in the comment section. <laughs> I think Villa, with their um, with their European commitments, and I do think Villa will win the Conference League. I think they don't quite have that depth, although they've coped brilliantly so far. I really think, you know, if Watkins was to get injured, um, which he hasn't done so far this season, or someone like a John McGinn, I think it does change what they're doing at the moment. But, you know, hats off to Unai Emery. I always said at the start of the season, Villa were, in my view, a team that were in the top four race. But, you know, when they got thumped at Newcastle on the opening day, it looked a bit silly. But I've always, you know, looked at Unai Emery's work with Villa in the second half of last season. But they're a serious, serious team. So who knows what happens in the window? A few signings can change the picture again. Um, do you think Spurs will, um, if they can navigate these coming weeks when they've got players away and injuries and they get likes of Madison back? I do think they're. Um, I think they've got a great run coming up as well, if I'm not mistaken. So I think Spurs will. Um, you know, they've had their uh, their wobble. Ryan, sorry. I know I said that was the last question. I've got to throw this one in. Our no, next worries. game is Man, Man City, FA Cup. We haven't yeah. won an FA Cup since 1991. Man City have come to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium five times. They've lost five times. They haven't scored a goal. Pep Guardiola is desperate to score a goal and win at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. This FA Cup game in the fourth round, how do you see that going? Fancy Spurs, and I did when the draw came out. I mean, as I just said about Manchester City, I think the Premier League is a different proposition um, in terms of, you know, they're a far superior side, in my opinion, to Tottenham. However, I think Spurs have been very good at home this season. Um, and obviously, there is that kind of, uh, that notion that's, that the City don't like playing at the stadium. So, I think Pep will probably rotate. Um, but I think Spurs, you know, are going to be up for it. The, the home crowd do make a difference. I've been in that stadium several times this season. And, you know, when the noise gets going, it's it's incredible. Um, it really is. So, yeah, I think that will be one that I think Anne would, you know, it goes without saying he'd want to win the FA Cup. But I think he would he will be actively, you know, maybe sort of having that very high on his list of priorities. Um, yeah. I know there's obviously um, no Europe this season, but... Um, Spurs are, are really desperate to win a trophy and I think, you know, they have to give it a go. I think they'll go full strength and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they caught um, they caught City on a, an off day. So I'm looking forward to that. It was a great tie when it came out of the hat. Ryan, I can't thank you enough. I know how busy you are during the January transfer window and, uh, well, you're busy every day anyway. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, where can no people problem. find you, what you're up to and uh, is the YouTube channel still going? I think it's died a death, Chris, to be honest. It's so hard. You me you mentioned there, you know, what it's like um, being a journalist nowadays. It's just it's just relentless. Um, so it's really hard to find the time. Um, and a lot of my time goes on, you know, 
getting stories and writing stories for, for the newspaper and obviously putting stuff online as well. So something I had to give. Um, I, I, I do see YouTube as something that can be revived, not necessarily strictly on transfers, but I would like to do stuff on, you know, what I do on a day-to-day basis, you know, press conferences and, and bringing news to the table. So um, at the moment, it's mainly X. Um, that I, uh, You can find my stuff on my at is Ryan Taylor Sport. Um, and it's the same on Instagram and Facebook as well when I do tend to, to post, you know, all the stories that I get. So, yeah, that would probably be the best place to find me. And thanks for having me as well. It's always a pleasure to come on here. So, um, yeah, thanks for giving me the nod. Pleasure. Thank you, Ryan. Always welcome. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on very soon. Everyone, please yeah. do check out Ryan's pages because, uh, of course, we, ho- we'll all, we all hope in the next couple of weeks he'll be uh, he'll be putting some stories out saying that Spurs have their third signing of this January transfer window. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you on the next one. Come on, you Spurs.